is a life of extremes. Both sides are slippery and enticing. These are my places of thrills. And this mindless recollection Thank you so much. That was a song called Smiling that I wrote for my new record called Such Pretty Forks in the Road. I'm Alanis Morissette. Um, and uh, this song, Smiling, was actually in the musical for Jagged Little Pill, which unfortunately is dark based on our circumstances. But um, it's one of my favorite parts in the whole musical. Um, Elizabeth um, who portrays MJ, um, Elizabeth Stanley, who portrays MJ in the musical, the lead character. Uh, performs that song in the middle of the musical. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. There's some really juicy ones here. We'll just dive right in. Um, how has being a mother changed my music moving forward? Um, 
I have a little extra consideration, even though there's a new song coming out entitled Ablaze, where I talk directly about my children. Um, I have a little bit more protectiveness, mama bear consideration. I've always had consideration for the people I write about because I'm a huge fan of revenge fantasy versus actual revenge. And I love anger, but the acting out of anger in the destructive way, I'm not that interested in, but I am interested in how anger can fuel and help us make decisions and set boundaries and say no and stand up for ourselves or our friends. Um, so there was a little bit more of a mama bear quality to how I approach pretty much everything, including songwriting now. And I think the other uh, noted difference for me is that in the past, before family, before children, I'd be able to really focus and just be singular, whether I'd be in the studio doing a vocal, if there was any movement or if there were people walking in the background, it would be really distracting to the point where I'd have to start over. Whereas now, <laughs> I have a child on my head, a child on my Breast, breastfeeding. I have a puppy nipping at my feet. I'm, you know, drinking a smoothie to get some calories, and I'm <laughs> texting and doing a vocal. So the multitasking has gone to a whole other level, um, and some of that kind of mayhem energy is definitely it found its way into this new record. Thanks for your question. Um, next question is: A lot of songs are very heartfelt and make me emotional. Do you get emotional in the studio? Um, I. If by getting emotional you mean a sobbing, crying mess, a weeping mess, yes. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it can happen while I'm writing. It can happen um, when I'm listening back to it. A lot of times when I write, it feels as though I'm channeling, for lack of a better term. It just feels like it's coming through me, and I'm just you know, hooked up to an IV and capturing whatever I can. And we would like to keep the first or second vocal often, if we can, to keep that urgency on what used to be called tape. Now it's digital. Um, but yeah, I'm crying all the time, basically. And um, any emotion, there's no emotion that is uh, not lovely, lovely enough to entertain. And the three emotions I specifically wasn't allowed in the context of patriarchy in my particular childhood was I couldn't feel sad, I couldn't feel angry, and I couldn't feel afraid, interestingly. So it goes without saying for me now that I'm used to the fact that whenever I go in the studio, all my unconscious stuff comes out. So anything that's been hiding or in the sediment at the bottom of the water, the tree and the, uh, the sand gets shaken all about. So this record is definitely touching on some postpartum activity. After my daughter was born, I've had postpartum uh, depression and anxiety and et cetera, et cetera, uh, after all three children. Uh, but knowing them and loving them makes it entirely and has made it entirely worth it for me if it, if it is not one of the hardest things to experience. But um, so the songs a song called Diagnosis on the record and Losing the Plot just really marked, not unlike every song I've ever written, just marked a snapshot of a time in my life where I was just commenting on what was going on. And in that particular moment, I was in Malibu starting to write the record, really taking a big look at what life was going to be about and what my value systems were and prioritizing were, priori my priorities were rearranging every 10 seconds with blossoming our family and being in Los Angeles, I had been in Los Angeles for 25 years and then I wondered, you know, maybe it was time for us to move up north to Northern California, which we did do. So I wrote a couple of songs, a song called Reckoning, I wrote after we arrived here. So it marks a really important time in my life. And then, of course, the act of sharing it with you, it, it is no longer mine. It can be done with what you would like to do with it in terms of having it support or validate or empathize or some people have given me feedback that's helped them maybe through college or through a divorce or through some grief around the death in a family. So for me, the biggest gift of all is that I can express myself to the point of feeling at least a cathartic experience in the writing of it. And, and I, I'm immediately not depressed as soon as I'm expressed authentically. But then the sharing of the song really becomes about my connecting with you and getting to know you more. So, and the process uh, has relatively stayed the same. I think the difference now is that I trust the process implicitly, whereas when I first started writing with Glenn Ballard in 1994, you know, I'd, I'd always have my fingers crossed that a song would come, I'd say a special prayer. Whereas now, um, I don't get cocky, but I definitely have a sense that a song will absolutely come, and it'll just be interesting to see what, what comes through. And I never really know what to title the record or what the themes are on the record until it's finished, so... Uh, there's an intentionality to just show up, but beyond that, I, I'm as surprised as anybody else. Um, next question. Uh, do your children understand how famous you are? Um, 
my oldest son, who's nine, has a sense of the uh, unusualness of our life <laughs> based on his mom doing what I do. But it's really normalized here, and how we normalize it is just that it's expression. So in our house, we just kind of consider expression, you know, it, everything's sort of equivalent. So choosing a T-shirt, baking a cake with some unusual ingredients, painting something, really sweet ritual right now. And I, I think it's happening in more places than I even know about. Um, my kids paint on rocks messages and leave them around the neighborhood. And then the next day there'll be rocks left with other kids. So it's our, it's our way of being able to make quick art pieces on rocks. So my point in sharing that is just that the expression is, um, is a big centerpiece of how we live. So when my son thinks about me in the public eye, he thinks, oh, it's a very public version that my mom does. He's titillated by it, I guess, or intrigued at least. Um, but what I noticed is that in the 60s and the 70s, fame was sort of a means to an end in some ways. Um, it wasn't just sort of an e egoic gratification moment. It was this song is going to be used as activism and artists were social activists by default. And um, Nowadays, I see it as two categories in a way, certainly a th the third option of the blend, but one side is the performance aspect, someone just singing and using their God-given gifts and really performing something, and then the other is the more sort of singer-songwriter, auto autobiographical sharing, and then there's the third option, which is a blend of all of both of those, which I think is the one I relate to the most, because, pardon me, I live for the performance aspect, but I also there must be a story told. I remember having been asked to write a party song. Landis, can you write a party song? And I said, well, I could write a party song, but it might be about how awkward I feel. And, and I'm feeling like a little bit of a wallflower and sh who should I go talk to? And should I go home? <laughs> so it'll be about a party per se, <laughs> but it might not be a party song, but that's what led me to uh, cover the, my humps video, Fergie. Cause I really wanted to challenge myself. Um, next question. Um, are, okay, what is the biggest challenge in making such pretty forks in the road? Um, there's no real challenge in terms of that grind. There's no uphill paddling, I guess is my point, but it does, it's very exhausting. It's kind of like a workout in a way. It's an emotional interiority workout because it's such a sacred opportunity to go all the way in and see what's going on in there. And and put it into a song. So I would say the challenge, um, I wouldn't even say it was challenging. I would say that it was kind of exhausting and, and maybe vulnerable in, in that sense, but it's not challenging. It's, it's actually exciting. And sometimes there are little junctures of time or periods of time, sorry, between records. Um, and then this one, I think it was about eight years since the last studio record. I had three children in, in, in that period of time <laughs> and a lot going on, writing a lot, activism, teaching, podcast, um, and again, just feeling expressed. And there, there was a time years ago where being a hyphenate, so to speak, or having any multiple talents was actually not considered a boon. I was encouraged many times to just pick a lane and stay in it. And Lord knows there's something to be said for hyper-focus. It really does get things done, I have found. However... Um, you know, I'm a kid in a candy store, so I just feel like there are so many archetypes that are fighting for the front seat, you know? I want to teach, I want to be a student, I want I live to be an artist, visual, photography, the fashionista archetype is up and running since I was, you know, two. Um, so yeah, they all, if they all have their moment in the sun, it's great. And of course, the most sacred roles for me is being a, a wife and a friend I think there's not enough songs written about friendships, by the way. I'm inspired to write more. Um, and, and, a, and a mom, a mom, friend, sister. Um, thank you for that question. Um, would you make another documentary during the next tour? Uh, it'd be interesting to see how touring as a mother compares to previous tours you've documented. Um, yeah, I would love to. <laughs> there's someone right to the right of me who might be willing to uh, take us up on that. But we'll be documenting as much as we possibly can, and and uh, you know some of it is wildly glamorous and glittery and sweaty and fantastic, and some of it is just you know I just envision whenever was a tiny baby being on a yoga ball in Italy, 
driving to our next gig at four in the morning and just bouncing on the yoga ball back and forth on the top layer of this, on the top level of this bus and having bruises up and down my legs and, you know, just as long as the baby's sleeping. <laughs> but it is a whole other experience. I mean, it's just multitasking to a whole other level to the point where based on the fact that I'm a highly sensitive person who's also an empath, I get flooded really quickly. So I just have to be careful. And I let my kids know sometimes I need six minutes. And if that means I have to hide in the bathroom, I will do what I need to do. Um, next question. What was your favorite part about developing Jagged Little Pill into a Broadway show? Wow. Um, there were a few things about that experience that were uh, game changers for me. One of which was I'd always had these visions and dreams and certainly I've manifested them on tour with crewmates and bandmates and, and you know, Communal experiences, nomadic communities traveling around the planet has always been my my dream. Um, and that dreams come true multifold. Um, but um, but doing the Broadway play with Diablo Cody and Diane Paulus and Tom Kitt and C.D. Larby um, choreographing, I mean, it was, it was, my mouth was agape half the time and just really being blown away by all these leaders, you know, and it, it goes to show, you know, there's the, the, there's often the thought that there can't be too many cooks or too many alphas. This is a disaster. In our case, I think there were just a lot of empowered leaders in this group to the point where we'd lean on each other when we needed to, we'd weigh in and throw our opinions around, um, you know, even if it wasn't our area of jurisdiction. So, you know, if Larby's trying to choreograph, he'll say he'll he'll have some feedback about how the emotional content of a scene is going, or you know, I'll I'll jump into costumes and lighting and sound, and you know, so we all all of us together we're keeping that star of Bethlehem um, as a united sort of mission statement focus, working around this musical for all of us and I, I think I can speak on everyone's behalf, um, became a movement of a kind for us. And a lot of the topics, if not all of them, most of them, there's one topic in the musical that I have no experience in. And I leaned on everyone else for, um, to make sure it was accurate, but pretty much everything in the musical I can relate to on some level. And uh, Diablo Cody basically pulled all the characters out of the songs. So there's this cohesiveness. I didn't want it to be a jukebox musical. So, um, because the characters were pulled out of songs, there's this real, um, just sounds like the music in the, the book that Diablo Cody wrote. It sounds as though they were written at the same time and that there is a integration there. So that's exciting and fortuitous. Um, but the biggest part for me is having some objectivity on these songs that I've been performing in a sort of monological way for many years. Um, there would be no way really other than I guess watching footage for me to have objectivity on these songs. I have never had it until I was in the audience watching beholding the musical in the workshops or rehearsals or the, the shows themselves and previews sobbing mess because I was actually receiving these songs and I had glimpses of, of a bit of a deeper understanding as to why people resonated with this record. So uh, and the community aspects. Traveling as a solo artist can be a little isolating, to say the least. So to be around all these people who are just, you know, cooking together, it's the greatest. It's like my dream kumbaya. Um, next question. Um, I listen to your music all the time to gain perspective. Do you ever listen to your own music to help you through situations? And if so, what are some of your go-to songs? Um one of the things I love the most about listening back to my own songs, which to be perfectly honest, I do a lot of while I'm mixing a record, but once the record's finished, I don't listen to it a lot. I actually listen to um, meditation music, if you can believe it. Everyone I've hung, with, hung out with over the years, they assume that if they're in my tour bus or hotel room, that there's just going to be like music playing nonstop at probably ear bleeding volumes. Um, but the opposite is actually true. There's so much stimulation and so much huge energy outside of break times that I'm typically a meditation music person. So a gentleman named Dave Harrington and, and myself are making a meditation record right now. We're in the middle of the process and I've been wanting to do that for a long time too. Just listen to something that could actually help my unregulate my nervous system, especially during these times. Um, and then in terms of songs that help something about the song, thank you. Whenever I listen to it, it kind of recalibrates my cells and uh, a song called Utopia. 
something about the harmonic chord changes and falsetto. Um, yeah, those those two are, are ones that, off the top of my head, I can think of that I've used as a resource for my own very self. Also, that I would be good. I remember writing that song in a closet. There was so much going on, and, and my lifestyle was such that there were people around, and it kind of remains the case to this day. Um, but like I said a, a minute ago, I basically hide whenever I can to just recharge the batteries to go back out and surf. So um, I was hiding in my closet. There were about 15 people downstairs, and I lit a candle, which is probably not the smartest thing to do in a closet. Do not try it at home. Um, and I wrote that I would be good, the song that I would be good in about – three minutes really quickly and it became kind of a, a prayer or a mantra to the point where when I perform it you know it's just this it's this anchoring of of things that I value and that I wish for and that and that this you know unconditional love is redundant to say unconditional because love is unconditional so just to, that sense of offering that to myself it's always yeah, pretty much. Oh, I can say this. I can say the word always. It's always been a unique challenge to offer self-love, you know, in, in times where some of the voices in my head are meanie beanie cruel. So um, sometimes just listening to that song or performing it, it just it levels the playing field and brings this tenderness back uh, toward myself that might have get, gotten, gotten a little jaggedy. Um, let's see. Next question. How did you come to work with Alex Hope and Catherine Marks? And okay, so I'll start with that. My PPD brain is uh, tracks a little less um, avidly these days, so I take things one at a time whenever I can. So first question was, oh yeah, Alex Hope and Catherine Marks. Um, so there were a few ideas and some really talented people and names that were run past or run up the flagpole, and they were all intriguing in their own right. Um, but once I met and had heard what Alex Hope had been up to producerially and who she was as a person, such a slam dunk, big, big yes. And then I always had a sort of sonic soundscape crush on Catherine Mark's production and uh, my bandmates actually recommended her. Um, anytime I have, I need some sort of perspective or support or, um, you know, ask questions to the brilliant people in the field. I often reach out to my bandmates. So I believe it was maybe Cedric or, or one of you who um, who suggested Catherine. So they shared the record. <clears throat> and um, it's, I guess it's common for people to have 27 producers on records in certain contexts. But um, I myself, I like to sequester and insulate a lot. So working with two producers was... Um, fun and uh, unusual for me because it was a group of songs that Catherine was working on and then Alex was working on her set of songs at the same time. And then the begged question was how, you know, am I going to attempt to create a little triangle hang time? And if the answer socially, relationally, of course I am. So we all met, took a couple photos together, geeked out. I think Catherine and Alex have hung out as well. So it wound up being a, a really social um safe, inspired, um, self-leadership kind of production story. But I love them both so much, and I, I can't wait to just do whatever we need to do to show up together to support this sweet record. They kick butt. Um, how is this writing of the record different from writing your previous albums? Um, I was in Malibu this time. I lived in, in L.A. for 25-ish years. And we were in Malibu by the ocean, and it was, um, I, I mentioned a little bit about how the writing process has been influenced by my being a mom, but it was a, it's a little bit more in and out, dogs, lunchtime, baby, <laughs> a little boo-boo band-aid. I'm going to go back and finish the vocal. <laughs> I like it, though. It's a beautiful mayhem. Um, Let's see. Okay, so you have different commercial land. This is a different commercial landscape compared to the initial fame in the in the '90s. Um, how do you see that in keeping productive and making more music? Um, there's no real stopping point for me in terms of songwriting. I I envision. I just it's an it's an existential imperative for me if I'm not writing, whether it's clickety clackety or singing, um, I get depressed almost instantly. Um, so it's actually a responsibility. It's a self-care tool to write. And unfortunately, because my experience of being in the public eye 
was associated with songwriting, there was a minute or two where I felt myself being frozen in terms of creating the next record after Jagged Little Pill or even creating the record um, Such Pretty Forks in the Road. It was, you know, I was basically, uh, you know, inspired in a whole different way. It's more like I feel full, for lack of a better way of describing it. I get to a point where I just feel I'm teeming with stories and I need to concretize this because if I don't do it now, I say to myself, so many new things will be happening and I will have skipped this whole era and not commented on it through art or through music, which of course is not true. We're commenting on our lives every 10 seconds by picking the food that we eat. Um, so, but, um, uh, yeah, the world is a different place. I kind of love the idea. I've always loved and will continue to love a, an album as like a piece um, 11 songs always, not always, often seems to be the magic number for me. Um, I don't know why, but I often write 25 songs and then I'll whittle it down to the final songs that are on the record. And and the sequence kind of, you know, there's two approaches for sequencing songs on a record for me. Sometimes it's just soundscape, making sure the keys and the harmonics in each song kind of have a nice flow from beginning to end. The other is, you know, do I want it to be a chronological storytelling, which if, ideally I would, but um, somewhere in between those two fight and then the sequence emerges. Um, and the title came at the last second and I'm writing a book as well and that title I have no idea. Um, and I know oftentimes in the literary world and definitely in music world, people don't, people want that title, <laughs> people want that cover. And I'm just like, I have no idea what this record's about. I'll get back to you in a month. Um, uh, you're thanking me for the songs, for supporting them, for supporting you, giving you strength in your life. And your question is, am I aware of how with my music I've influenced an entire generation? The Canadian in me is just like, Ooh, huh? <laughs> is that true? No, I feel, I feel so much a part of the movement. You know, I just, how I saw the nineties where the feminist movement was, which I call the feminine movement was that this huge wave was coming and I just volunteered with my surfboard. Like I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll do it. And I, you know, I'll get on that, the top of that cresting wave and I'll ride it all the way in like a little soldier. Um, so yes, I do feel a part of a voice that helped, that helped um, mark what people are feeling. One of the biggest um, inquiries or research rabbit holey parts of my when I spend time alone at night usually I'm nocturnal that's the only time I get alone is I'm I'm just sort of chasing um I'm just chasing how to stay expressed and how to make sure uh, I just forgot the question entirely sorry guys but it's my postpartum depression my um in the song diagnosis I say that I can't remember where the sentence started when I'm trying to finish it it's actually true. Um, but wait, let me make sure I answer that question. Um, oh, yeah. I, I probably blacked it out or blocked it out because it's an ego question. Um, my ego is is psyched to have been part of um, a big change. Like, as an example, when You Ought to Know was being released, it, we were sent it to a lot, a lot of radio stations, and the program directors would say, oh, yeah, we're already playing Sinead O'Connor, so we can't play Alanis' song. We already have a woman, thanks. Or they'd say, yeah, we got Tori Amos, we're good. You know, so thankfully everything changed. I think I think on a sort of monetary business side of things, what happened was a female artist was a bankable star and all of a sudden it became cool to have, you know. I mean, women have been writing music and creating and inventing and being brilliant since the dawn of time and before. So the fact that the music industry shifted toward more of an openness through from any gender is very exciting to me. And it was during a time where the light was being shined on the contracts, uh, artist contracts uh, with record companies. It was almost like the industry could stay. I, I talk about it being sort of a sick industry in the song Reasons I Drink. The industry, anything unchecked, anything that's not accountable to anyone or anything, you know, there's a potential for some danger there. So <clears throat> basically um, I loved that the MP MP3 as the technological evolution happened, a lot of people started to look at contracts and look at how artists were signed and what are these deals? And, you know, is there a sense of partnership in this? I think the biggest shock for most people in, 
in other industries, when the digital era came on, I went to C-SPAN to speak on behalf of artists. And I think where the biggest shock was, was not only the length of time that record companies would keep artists on, but also um, um, what were they surprised about? Oh, just how secretive it was. And, and in some ways, how unconscionable some of it was. You know, it wasn't an entire win-win yet. Um, I really believe at this point, we're either going to do partnership and we're going to move into this hyper-relational uh, place where we look at how we are as humans, you know, in school, there's conventional, all the five R's that are taught and how to function relationally is often completely ignored in school. And yet it's our, it's our ace in the hole in terms of um, getting new jobs and meeting new people and, and learning how to be relational and still authentic. I mean, these are all developmental tasks and growing up markings that, um, that I think with all of us being home in this pandemic kind of unfortunate circumstance, I've seen it certainly in myself and my family, but also my friends and those around me, allowing this time to really kind of alchemically crunch us into who are we? Why are we here? What's the most important thing? What do I value? On my deathbed looking back when I'm 123, what would I like to see? What would I like to have, you know, have contributed? What, what would what would I have wanted my life to represent? You know, not so much in the egoic, like, oh, I left a big legacy. Couldn't care less about that. Um, but what I'm more, what I'm more interested in is, you know, what was shared while I was here, and and did I, were my priorities and my value systems matched with with how I showed up, and with what I did every day. Um, maybe one more question before we do uh, another performance of ironic. Um, what do I think about the more uh, open discussions about mental health in the entertainment world? Awesome. My theory, I mean, I have a few theories about, about the effects of fame, but particularly on a lot of artists, I think of Jimi Hendrix and I think of uh, Janis Joplin. I think of a lot of people um, who have these God-given gifts, whether it to be to write or to sing or perform or, you know, that sort of multiple adult giftedness. Um, and there's an introversion or a high sensitivity or, or they're an empath. So these gifts are coming through them in the form of song, as an example. But they don't necessarily have the armor or the um, temperament to be able to survive the influx of unsolicited you know, feedback. Um, you know, I'd be walking through airports, people would try to cut my hair, they'd sneak into hotel rooms. There was a lot of invasion of, of boundaries and a lot of just straight up stimuli, whether it's meeting 150 new people a day. And so I, you know, a lot of that, I think the, the sentence a lot of people use is if someone commits suicide, like this person was much too sensitive for this world. Um, one of my main missions right now is to support those of us who are really sensitive in how to navigate this world and also in the meanwhile contribute to shifting how this culture and this society and this world operates. You know, 20% of humans and animals are highly sensitive in that if a highly sensitive temperament walks into a room, we get 500 pieces of information, whereas a non, non-sensitive, not to mean insensitive, but non-highly sensitive temperament walks in a room and gets 50 pieces of information. So it might go without saying that we're getting a lot of information and I've, I've been very inspired lately to, to talk more deeply about what it is to be an empath and the kinds there are and a highly sensitive temperament and how we can be responsible for that and still function really well in the world and not make, you know, what could be really intense here everyone else's problem. So to answer the question, yes, I couldn't be happier about people talking about their challenges, you know, OCD, depression, anxiety. I mean, especially during this time at home, I was having nightly panic attacks to the point where I was using somatic experiencing Peter Levine at some points. Like I was just like, there's, there are so many anxiety attacks happening on the daily that I want to experiment with this. I want to do like a full body scan while I'm in the middle of, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, I know panic attacks so intimately that I know when it's coming on. So I had my first one at a, in a movie theater when I first moved to LA and there's a thing called um, relaxation induced anxiety. So a lot of people, when they talk about mental health with me, the, the first go to it very understandably is, you know, mindfulness and meditation. And I think for some of us who have really, really loud, very mean voices in our heads, meditation isn't always the first go to, 
um, simply because it can just leave you there in silence, but it's not silent. The voices really have a field day. So sometimes it looks like going for a walk, medication. I'm a big fan if anybody needs medication. Touch, and that's the, the challenging part with, with us you know, social distancing right now is that touch is so important. And we do live in a culture that gets freaked out about impropriety and, and you know, the Me Too movement is so gorgeous. And so, I mean, I think this is an egregiously undertouched culture, but touch being held in a non-sexual way, in a respectful, consensual way is incredibly healing for the nervous system. Um, so I've just really become, I've always been obsessed with the human condition, but I'm even more so now with personality disorders, developmentalism, attachment, what do these behaviors, what do these actions, what do these attunements result in, in our relationships? Does it result in healing? Are we just pouring salt in each other's wounds? Can we do this together? What does communalism mean? You know, so next record, I'll get into all that. But I just want to thank you all so much for your really, really insightful and thoughtful questions and for, for being here. And um, this uh, will end our party uh, with a version of Ironic. And Godspeed, bless you, take care of yourselves out there, you're not alone, love you, and to be continued. Die the next day. It's a black fly in your chardonnay. It's a death row pardon. Two minutes too late. And isn't it ironic? Don't you think it's like red? Don't you think a little 